Today on the Matt Walsh Show, we will play the one clip that puts the debate over Disney grooming to rest and proves once and for all, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they do have an agenda to groom and indoctrinate children. Also, Elon Musk is now officially on the verge of becoming Twitter's new owner, and Democrats move to legally bar Marjorie Taylor Greene from running for re-election. If you can't beat him in the ballot box, just take him to court, apparently. Plus, Taylor Lorenz comes up with the lamest possible excuse to justify doxing libs of TikTok. And in our daily cancellation, a stay-at-home dad weeps over the fact that his son is becoming, quote-unquote, traditionally masculine. What's a gender-bending dad supposed to do in that situation? We'll talk about all that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Just like the foundation of this great country is the Constitution, the foundation of your family should be your faith and your beliefs. So I have a serious question for you. If something should happen to you or your spouse, who do you trust to instill those same core beliefs and values in your children? Do you think it's uh, the same person the state would assign them to? If you don't have a will in place, you have no say in the future of your children. Let that sink in for a minute. And if you're single and you don't think you need a will, you could not be more wrong. A will allows you to establish advanced directive and medical power of attorney do you really want to leave the burden of deciding life support or not to your family members or, or close friends? Of course not. A will allows you to clearly communicate to your loved ones what your wishes are regarding your health. If you haven't made one yet, you're not alone, but we're gonna make it easy for you at epicwill.com when you use promo code Walsh. We are so excited that they're partnering with us at The Daily Wire. They're protecting our staff and their families. Let them protect yours. Epicwill.com, promo code Walsh. This is how easy it is. You can secure your future in as little as five minutes with a complete will package starting at $119. And when you use promo code Walsh, you'll save 10%. Epicwill.com. This will be the most important five minutes you spend today. You know, very often in our world today, we are told that we must disbelieve our lying eyes. Truths that are right in front of us, plain as day, are to be rejected as mere figments of our imagination. The most obvious realities become conspiracy theories, statements of basic fact or propaganda. We run fact checks on self-evident certitudes, and the fact check corrects the record. Reality is not reality, we are informed. The sun is not in the sky. Water is not wet. There is no gravity. We're not living on planet Earth. Nothing that you see is real. The self-assigned arbiters of truth assure us. Don't rely on your own common sense. Close your eyes which so often deceive you anyway, and let them guide you to and fro. Let them be your window into the world. They will tell you what is real and what isn't. And they, our culture's truth deciders, have decided that all of the recent talk about grooming is absurd, outrageous, offensive, bigoted. It's all just a bunch of anti-gay fear-mongering, they say. And the claim that Disney, Disney of all companies, Disney, not Disney, the claim that they're actively grooming and sexualizing children is, is the most ludicrous falsehood of all, they insist. That's why, they tell us, the move in Florida last week to take away Disney's special tax privileges was a catastrophic overreaction. Worse, it was an all-out assault on the First Amendment somehow. I mean, Disney has no constitutional right to the extra privileges afforded it by Florida, but um, now that it has those privileges, taking them away is unconstitutional, we're told. It's an unnecessary act of retribution. Disney didn't do anything to deserve, this, to deserve this. Poor, helpless Disney, that $200 billion damsel in distress. Disney now needs its own Prince Charming to come rescue it. But unfortunately, Disney declared years ago that those kinds of characters are misogynistic, retrograde, gender essentialist. And so there is no one left to save them. They are abandoned to the clutches of the dastardly DeSantis. A man who, we are reminded, completely made up this whole issue of Disney grooming children. That is entirely fictional. And yet, there are, of course, many examples we can point to and have pointed to many times recently of Disney endorsing, encouraging, and, and often actively engaging in predatory grooming practices towards children. We've gone through the partial catalog, enough to prove the point, I think, but we've missed one example. One example so disgusting and twisted and over the top that it's really the only one we need. The conversation could begin and end right here. Anyone defending Disney, anyone claiming that the grooming label is unfair or overboard, anybody, including people on the right, panicking over Florida's revocation of Disney's legal privileges should be confronted with this clip. This is from an episode of Good Morning America on ABC, which is, of course, owned by Disney. Because when we're talking about Disney, we're not just talking about Disney World and Mickey Mouse and uh, the Little Mermaid. We're talking about all of the media properties that Disney owns, like ABC. 
Now, what you're about to see happened on live TV on a major network in front of a live studio audience. I didn't dig this up from the darkest fringes of the internet. This is as mainstream as it gets. It's what Disney promotes and supports. So here's the time when Good Morning America featured an 11-year-old boy in drag. The child's stage name is Desmond is Amazing. And everyone in the building, including the hosts, including uh, Michael Strahan, who's one of the hosts, seem to very much agree that what you're about to see is indeed amazing. Here it is. Please welcome Desmond Naples, a.k.a. Desmond is Amazing. <laughs> I love that you love root beer caffeine free. Mm -hmm. I can get on board with that. My mom doesn't like me drinking caffeine. Does it make you hyper? Yeah, me too. They don't like when I drink caffeine either. But Jasmine, you're one of the youngest and first drag queen slash kids. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, you, I've heard that you've gotten messages from young adults who look up to you for being who you are. What are some of the notes you've gotten? Some of the notes I've gotten are like that you inspire me very much and I wish I could have had the support that you have um, when I was a child. Now, if you're listening to the audio podcast, you have been spared the worst of what we just experienced altogether. Um, but you can't fully appreciate just how dark and deranged it was because Desmond, the 11-year-old drag kid, quote-unquote, Prances out on stage in women's clothes, makeup caked on his face, dances for the adoring crowd of grown adults, at one point lays himself out prostrate on the ground on the stage while creepy Michael Strahan stares and claps. And then he sits down for a lengthy interview. And later in this segment, um, this segment that was aired on Disney's ABC, even though Disney totally is not trying to groom children at all. Later in the segment, three adult drag queens are brought out on stage with Desmond in their full cross-dressing costumes, woman face fully on, and they proceed to give Desmond gifts of makeup and quote-unquote dance classes. Watch. You guys want to tell us what's out here real quick? Well, I, I see. I, I drew Desmond a little green-haired lady. It, it's, <laughs> it's for you. It's to bring you good luck and prosperity in your future. And, and to eat iceberg lettuce. And to eat iceberg lettuce. Good roughage, okay? There you go. <laughs> With tomatoes and cucumbers. Absolutely. <laughs> and I brought you a gift basket of some of the, my favorite. Mean? Actually, you know what? Let me actually hand it to you because I think you need to have it in your yes, hand. Look at those it is some of my favorite makeup essentials that I use always. I will never understand so many things about what we're seeing here, but um, one of them is that is is how every woman is not insulted when they see the drag queens, and I know so many women are, in fact, but every woman should be insulted because because uh, I mean, leaving aside the worst part about this, which is the fact that there's a kid there, we'll get back to that in a second, but um, you see that and like that's what they think of you. That's that's their impression of you. It is no different from blackface. It is female blackface. It is, a, it is a mockery of womanhood. This is what they think you are. This is their female impression. And if it seems cartoonish and degrading, that's because it is. And that's how they see femininity, as a degraded, cartoonish thing. By the way, if you're wondering where the father is in all of this, um, surprisingly... Or maybe not surprisingly, he is in the picture. He's literally in the picture. He's in the audience during this segment. He's one of the greasy, disgusting old men staring and clapping while the young boys paraded around in cross-dressing burlesque gear. Desmond may as well be wearing a sandwich board sign which announces, I am a sexual abuse victim because his abuse is on full display for all to see and the audience loves every minute of it. And ABC loves it and Disney loves it. 
Now, those who wish to mitigate and minimize this will point out that this segment aired back in 2018. This is not new. It's old news. I've already been told this today after I posted this segment on Twitter. People say, this is old news. Why are you posting this? Because to them, apparently, child sexual abuse doesn't matter if it happened a few years ago. But maybe they'd have a point that its relevance to the current news cycle is minimized if there had already been an overwhelming public outrage about this spectacle and everybody involved was fired and Disney had issued a public apology and there was already a reckoning of that sort. But no such reckoning occurred. Nobody was fired. Nobody apologized. There wasn't even any real backlash. Michael Strahan got a major contract extension last year after this. Everybody involved rode happily into the sunset, except for Desmond himself, who is still being paraded around and used as a prop by the LGBT left and his evil, exploitative, ghoulish, abusive parents. Desmond has been sent into gay clubs to dance for money. That's a real thing. This child in drag has danced at gay clubs at night while grown adult gay men throw money at him on stage. He's appeared in videos with adult gay men where he pantomimes snorting ketamine off of his hand, something that no 11-year-old should know how to do or be aware of. Um, Just for reference, here's that moment. Anyone can do drag. Everyone can do drag. Everyone can do drag. Your mom can do drag. What has this world come to? It's come to a world where drag kids actually exist. And people do ketamine on a couch. And people do ketamine on a couch. Okay. Yeah, so he's uh, so that's uh, during some kind of Facebook Live or something, and he's done a lot of these where he's where he appears with adult um, cross-dressing men. And uh, very often in the videos, he appears to be on drugs. I mean, he appears this 11-year-old boy <clears throat> who very clearly appears to be drugged. And in that video, he... Now, that's not something that 11-year-old should know anything about. Do ketamine on a couch. And then he, he... But why was he doing that? Because at the very least, he sees it happen all the time. And I think we can assume that, he's, that, that a lot more than just seeing it has occurred. So this boy is quite clearly being drugged, abused, and exploited in front of the whole world. And um, nothing is being done to stop it. On the contrary, Disney is there to celebrate and promote it. Meanwhile, the whole concept of drag kids and the mixing of drag queens and kids with things like Drag Queen Story Hour, that's only become more mainstream, more common, more popular since 2018. Once the left learned that it could put something like that on a network television morning show, that was actually a, a, a pivotal, I believe, a pivotal moment in our culture was that. Lots of people never knew that it even happened. But that they could put that on Good Morning America um, and there's no backlash because of it. Nobody even complains. Well, they knew they could get away with a whole lot more. And that's what they set out to do. Disney learned this lesson also. The only problem with the current backlash against grooming, especially Disney's grooming of kids, isn't that it's too harsh or over the line or too vengeful or unconstitutional. It's none of those things. The problem is that it's many years too late. Boys like Desmond have already been destroyed while so many conservatives were distracted or too afraid to say anything. Now that we're finally clued in, there is very little we could do that we could possibly do in holding Disney and other groomers accountable that would be truly overboard. Certainly taking away their special cushy privileges doesn't even come close to that. I mean, we could forget about everything else that Disney has done. Okay? We could put all of that to the side. We could skip over everything and just focus on this one segment, on one episode of Good Morning America in 2018. And that would be all by itself way more than enough to justify everything that's happening to Disney right now. The only problem would be that it took too long. Taking away tax benefits should be the least of it. Why should a company be able to keep its tax benefits after putting that on the air? You answer me that. I want any conservative who has a problem with this to answer me that. Why should they be able to keep their tax privileges while doing that? 
in a sane and just and healthy society, all of the adults involved would, would you know, the, the tax privileges would be the least of it because all the adults involved in producing and filming that segment would be in jail if we were a sane society. Desmond's parents would have life sentences in solitary confinement at a minimum. The backlash against Disney would have been so overwhelming and intense as to totally bankrupt and destroy the company. That's what should have happened. What should still happen? Instead, we have to settle for making them pay taxes. You know, that's not such a steep price to pay when you think of it like that. Now let's get to our five headlines. All right, parents, listen up. We've all seen the countless examples of how radical radical leftists have been destroying American schools. It's no longer just about the terrible math and reading levels. Now radical left teachers birthed from liberal universities are forcing gender indoctrination in, ch- in kindergarten. They're teaching lessons on white guilt. They're pushing critical race theory in classrooms. We know all the things that they're doing. Since COVID, parents have exposed dozens of violent and sexually explicit books in libraries. Countless school boards have done nothing, and the DOJ treated concerned parents like terrorists. If you want a real education for your child, you need to check out Freedom Project Academy. Unlike public schools, Freedom Project Academy has perfected live online learning over the course of a decade. They're built on Judeo-Christian values and classical curriculum dedicated to providing mastery of subject matter, not propaganda. So go to freedomforschool.com. That's freedomforschool.com and request your free information packet today. The average high school graduate is reading at a seventh grade level. Think about that for a second. Don't let that happen to your child. Classes are filling up, so please don't wait until the last minute. That's freedomforschool.com, freedomforschool.com. All right, um, so I got to ask you this real quick. So tell me if I deserve to be bullied for this. Over the weekend, uh, my wife, once again, was cyber stalking, harassing, and, and fat shaming me. And this time she told everybody that on Saturday I had six slices of pizza in one sitting with nacho cheese. Now, here's the thing, and I'm getting a lot of harassment over this. The thing is, out of context, that sounds pretty bad. You know, it sounds like gluttonous and disgusting and reprehensible. But that's why you need to wait until you get all the facts before you believe rumors on the Internet, especially if they're started by my wife. Here are the facts. I did actually eat all of that, but I still rate the claim false because crucial details are missing. And I've learned from the fact checkers you can do that. Something could be totally true, but if it's not, if, if not all the facts are given, then it's false now. So this is false because here are the facts. We ordered a bunch of pizza. We had a lot left over. I did my part to eat more because, as my parents always told me when I was a kid, there are starving kids in China. And somehow they are helped when you stuff your fat face, even after you're already full. As far as the nacho cheese, I'd never done that before, but... The pizza place where we ordered it, they asked, would you like nacho cheese with the pizza? I'd never, no one ever asked me that at a pizza place before. What am I going to say? No. Somebody asks if you want nacho cheese as a side, no matter what your meal is, are you going to say, no? no one would say no to that. So you say yes. And I tried it. And uh, frankly, it was a revelation. I cannot recommend it enough. Nacho cheese and pizza. It changed my life. My life and my waistline will never be the same again. All right, um, maybe slightly bigger news than me eating six slices of pizza is this from Reuters. Twitter is poised to agree to a sale um, to Elon Musk for around $43 billion in cash, which was the best and final offer that he made a couple weeks ago. And originally they said they want to know part of it. Um, At least the board, the board said that. Um, Twitter may announce the, uh, the deal later on Monday once its board has met to recommend the transaction to Twitter shareholders, the source has said. It's always possible the deal collapses at the last minute. The source has added, Musk, the world's richest person, according to a tally by Forbes, is negotiating to buy Twitter at a personal capacity, and Tesla is not involved in the deal. Now, listen, <clears throat> I'm not ready to, to build any statues to Elon Musk just yet. Well, I take that back. I think I, I would build them. I, I would build a statue to Elon Musk f- right now for no other reason than how offensive it would be to the left. Like, if I was president, I would commission a 70-foot statue of Elon Musk like just r- maybe right in the middle of Washington, D.C., and I would put it alongside the 70-foot statue of Christopher, Col- Christopher Columbus that I'm going to build and the statue of, of uh, Stonewall Jackson murdering an endangered panda with a gun, which will be labeled assault rifle on the side of it. 
Um, that's my campaign promise. My only campaign promise is that I'm going to do that. The point is, aside from annoying the left, I would not be building monuments to Elon Musk, but I do think that he will uh, obviously go down as one of the most significant humans of, of our century. And on top of that, he's one of the only rich guys in the world right now that I can think of who's actually doing cool things with his money. Not just cool things, but things that are making the world a better place. Like, let, let's, let's contrast this with Mark Zuckerberg, who's, who's, who's uh, not the richest guy in the world. You know, he's only worth like $100 billion rather than $200 billion or whatever it is. Um, it's practically a, a pauper compared to, to Elon Musk. But he's taking all of that, and his big project is the metaverse. And so what he wants to do instead is, um, you know, he noticed that, that, that people are wasting their lives on the internet, and that the internet has taken over our lives, especially for kids. And so his idea is, let's take that situation and make it a million times worse. Let's make it exponentially worse. People have forsaken, o- almost, they have all but forsaken their regular physical lives so let's just take the almost out of it and make sure that people entirely forsake their physical lives and just walk around with these goggles on their face where they lived in a, in a, in a virtual world, where they become like literally consumed by the internet. So that's Mark Zuckerberg's project is to do that. Meanwhile, Elon Musk is doing this. You know, he's buying Twitter, trying to protect free speech. He's going into space. Think of, think of the, just the contrast there between the two rich guys. One is like he's he's trying to make your life even smaller, removing you even from your physical environment, um, so that your your horizons are not just diminished but actually extinguished, so you can no longer see the horizon anymore. And for Elon Musk, though, on the other hand, it's expanding our horizons, going out, discovering more of the physical universe that we all live in. Um, and that's a great thing, but the left hates him, and they hate him, even though Tesla is, by the way, doing more to save the environment. If the environment needs saving at all, then he's doing more to save it than any, certainly any company in the world, and also certainly any government in the world. But they hate him primarily and really solely because he could use his vast wealth to stifle dissident voices, that would, dissident voices as far as the left con- is concerned. Voices that the left thinks are dissident. Um, He could use his wealth to do that. And he could be a a huge asset in their camp in squashing these voices. But he's not. He's going the other direction. He's trying to expand free speech, give more people a platform to speak and have their voices heard. And they hate him for that. That is his great crime as far as they're concerned. Um, All right, this is from CNN. Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia was confronted in court on Friday over past social media posts advocating violence against Democrats, allegedly. This is CNN's, this is CNN's uh, version of events. At the hearing in Atlanta, to determine if Green is constitutionally barred from running for re-election because of her alleged role in the January 6th insurrection, the Congresswoman repeatedly said she couldn't remember past comments or interactions. CNN's K-File reported last year prior to being elected to Congress. Green had repeatedly indicated support for executing prominent Democratic politicians in 2018 and 2019 in comments and posts on social media. This, again, is is CNN's claim. Um, And I would not believe it for a damn second until they give proof of it. At the hearing, Green initially denied she had called House Speaker Nancy Pelosi a traitor to our country, which even if she did, so what? I mean, I call Nancy Pelosi a traitor to our country, too, because she is in many ways. Um... And then it went on from there, and they're, they're, th- this is what they're trying to do, is that they're trying to, as it says in the article, it's like the, actually the one honest thing, the one truthful thing that I read in the article so far, is that they want to legally bar uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene from seeking re-election. Which, by the way, they wouldn't even consider doing if they thought they could just defeat her at the ballot box, but they don't think they can, and so they're going this route instead. A lot of video, a lot of clips have uh, surfaced from this whole kangaroo trial. Um, This was my favorite moment, though, the way that uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene handled this. Listen to this. And when you uh, were notified that people had entered the Capitol illegally, did you also understand at that point that there had been violence at the Capitol? 
I only knew what I was told. I'd heard, I'd heard a gunshot. We all heard it. And um, we were so confused. We thought Antifa was breaking in or BLM because of those were the riots that had gone on and on all throughout 2020, day in and day out. Uh, just horrible riots all over the country. And that was the only thing that made sense to most of us. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Because, like, of course, she didn't actually think that Antifa and BLM was, was, were, were breaking in. Um, but that's just her way of bringing up an important point that that's the rioting that happened. That those, the, those are the riots that we should be worried about. That plagued uh, not just D.C. for a couple of hours on one day, but plagued cities across the country for months and even years on end. So that was her way of bringing that up, which I think, just think is, uh, is great. The part that's not so great about this is that the left, while they accuse everybody else of, of waging war on democracy, they call everything an attack on democracy. I mean, they're doing it right now with the situation in Florida with Disney. So taking away this, a mega corporation, a billion dollar mega corporation's tax benefits and simply saying, to use their words, you have to pay your fair share like everybody else does. So that's an attack on democracy. That's an attack on the Constitution. And they, they make that claim and are, in fact, supported by a lot of conservatives as they make it. A lot of conservatives are, are joining arms with the left on that point and saying that, yes, this is a let's 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 all link arms and circle around Disney. You shall not pass. Um, while they're saying that. Just you go north you know, a few hundred miles, and here they are in Atlanta trying to bar one of their opponents from seeking re-election. On what pretense? But because she had a, offensive tweets, allegedly, in 2019? Accusing her of, like, somehow being involved in the rioting, of fomenting insurrection, even though there was no insurrection? And she obviously wasn't in, and the rioting that did occur, she wasn't involved in it. And at no point did she stand in front of a crowd and say, yes, everyone, let's go invade the Capitol. She never said that. So they, there's, they're searching for a pretense, but they don't really even need it. And they know that because the media is going to have their backs. And um, they're just trying to bar the, an opponent who they can't defeat in the ballot box. Instead, they're going to go to court and try to stop her from seeking reelection. If, if we could call anything an attack on democracy, this is it. But you know what? On the other hand, um, here I am complaining about it. And so conservatives have been complaining about it. And some Republicans, a lot of Republicans have just kept their mouth shut about this because they don't want to, um, establishment Republicans and so on, you know, they, they don't want to be seen taking Marjorie Taylor Greene's side. So they're just putting nails in their own coffin because if you allow them to do this to her, then they're going to do it to you next. And you might say, well, I'm not like her. I'm different. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of the good ones. No, as far as the left is concerned, there are no good ones on our side. But rather than complaining about it, you know, since they have set this standard now and they've said these are the rules now, that you can bar someone from seeking re-election if you can tie them to a riot, no matter how precarious that uh, connection happens to be. Well, if those are the rules, then great. Let's play by those rules. See, what we have to stop doing is allowing the left to have their own rules. Of course, they're going to take they're going to take that privilege. Speaking of privileges, they're going to take that privilege if we give it to them. And for years, for decades, we have given it to them. We've basically said, yeah, you can have it. You can do it that way. You can play by those rules. We're, we're too good for that. So we're going we're gonna to lose with dignity year after year, decade after decade, while our culture and society are destroyed and children are destroyed and the family is destroyed and our civilization collapses. Uh, we're going to let all that happen uh, because, because, you know, it's, just, it's the dignified thing to do. No, these are the rules now. So rather, once we're done complaining about it, we can complain about it a little bit. And then once we're done that, um, now we, we flip it around and we say we, we find every single Democrat who actually encouraged and fomented rioting, BLM rioting for months on end, and we do the same to them. 
Why? Every single one of them should be up on the stand. Every single one of them should be dragged into court. The entire squad, this is what the Republicans should be doing, trying to legally bar them from ever seeking re-election because of how they encourage rioting. And they actually did, explicitly. I mean, they, they were uh, AOC and Ilhan Omar and all the rest of them doing, in, doing Instagram lives and stuff like that, saying, calling for more unrest. There has to be unrest in the streets and all that kind of stuff. So rather than simply complaining about it, these are the rules. If you can tie a politician to rioting, then you can um, proceed to bar them from running for re-election. Okay, well, that, that puts a lot of Democrats on the docket. That puts a lot of them on the hot seat. Unless we decide we're too good for that. And, and the right thing and the moral thing is just to allow this to be a tool that only your enemies use. Yet another tool that they use to devastate and decimate you while you stand by and watch. Because somehow it's dignified or something. Um, So there's a lot of outrage right now at Publix, the grocery store, um, that supposedly, uh, the the grocery store, supposedly some of of the the sponsors of the Florida anti-groomer bill Received some donations from Publix. I don't even know if that's true or not, but it did lead to this, which is pretty funny. Um, this is from a, a leftist activist, Jack Patakis. Is that how you pronounce his last name? Uh, who knows? I, I'm sure I butchered it. He says, Today I resigned from Publix. After four years of service, I was so disheartened when the company failed to even make a statement following more than $200,000 in donations to the sponsors of the quote unquote don't say gay bill. Let's all call on Publix to stop funding hate. Now, this, this guy, Jack, this is like a kid, okay? So he's not, when he says he resigns from Publix, he's not on, he's not in the corporate side of it. He's not a, you know, a VP or, or something. This, this kid's like a cashier. He's bagging groceries, and he just, he just uh, announced his resignation. I, like, just, just some news for you. Um, you don't get to resign from jobs, Resigning, you have to be, I'm, I'm going to put the cutoff at 25 or over at least. And you have to be making more than minimum wage to resign. When you're like 16 years old, pushing carts around the parking lot, which by the way, is a very noble job, but you're doing that, you're bagging groceries, you don't get to resign, you just quit. And not only did you quit from your job, but you made a big public statement about it and you're blasting your former employer. And that's something that, Prospective future employers are going to see, and they're going to be a little bit reluctant now to hire you as well they should be. I resign. Uh, no, you just quit, kid. That's all you did. You just quit your job. Uh, meanwhile, on the Florida bill, Randy Weingarten, who's the head of one of the largest teachers unions in the country, she was on MSNBC, and uh, she had some thoughts on the Florida bill. Let's listen to those. Have you had conversations with uh, LGBTQ teachers in terms of how they have been targeted uh, just for merely existing in the classroom? I mean, I remember teachers just openly talking about personal experiences and what they've gone through. And now we're seeing how by merely existing, they have been targeted and smeared as a danger to their students. So, you know, obviously um, I have and I've talked to several gay teachers who are members of our union um, to just, um, you know, be their backstop. Um, P flag did an amazing, um, petition for one of those teachers in Florida, a remarkable elementary school teacher, kindergarten teacher, beloved by his kids and, 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 and the parents of his kids. And he was immediately terrorized, um, after the bill was passed and signed by DeSantis, um, because he's gay. Um, We have to let gay kids and gay teachers, frankly, we have to let everyone talk about their lived experience. That's part of how you build relationships. That's part of how you unite people. That's part of how you save a democracy. Of course, she she got it all in there. I was waiting, we got lived experience and I was waiting, could we get one or a couple other things on the bingo card? Uh, and she got Save Democracy, so she got there, that in there, too. So we got lived experience, Save Democracy. Um, 
she didn't. I was hoping for the January 6th tie-in, and we didn't get that. But we did, of course, get homophobia, stop hate. So I think there's enough for a bingo there. Um, we, have to, we have to allow people to talk about their lived experiences. Yeah, well, this is not the anti-lived experience bill. Um, I wish it was. I wish it was a bill banning people from even using the phrase lived experience. That's another thing that I would do if I was in charge. But it's not. So there is nothing in the bill which stops anyone from talking about their lived experiences. It doesn't even stop teachers from talking about their own lived experiences, even though they should not be talking about their lived experiences, because that's not why the kids are there. They're not there to learn. It's not story time where they're learning stories about your lived experience. They're there to learn um, the academic subjects that you ostensibly, supposedly, are supposed to be teaching them. Then what we get from the MSNBC anchor, this uh, line of, this is another thing that goes on the bingo card, attacked for merely existing. How often do we hear this? This is always the line. LGBT people are being attacked for merely existing. No, this is a a bill and the whole anti-grooming effort on the right is targeting actions, certain unacceptable behaviors and actions. And very specifically in this case, the action of sexually indoctrinating children. So are you saying, as the MSNBC anchor, are you saying that sexually indoctrinating kids is such a crucial part of the LGBT identity. It's such a part of the culture that if you take that away from them, you have have essentially removed their ability to exist. Are you saying that the existence of the LGBT community depends on indoctrinating and recruiting kids into it? Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. That that appears to be what you are saying. which is an interesting claim from you. Something worth thinking about, perhaps. Um, Next, Taylor Lorenz has, I think, been workshopping some excuses for why she decided to dox libs of TikTok. And she appeared on CNN over the weekend, and this is the excuse that she has settled on. Let's listen to it and see if it's convincing at all. It's rare to see an account gain so much prominence so quickly and be shaping these narratives in such an effective way, especially against trans people. Um, So I was, I mean, my story was kind of long, but I really wanted to make the case like why this account mattered. And I think it's incredibly important, you know, as someone that covers the influencer industry to know who is exerting influence in in this way. I mean, for all we knew, this could have been a foreign actor, right? Or someone we just didn't know. And so I thought, hey, look, this account has massive power, massive influence. This woman is basically on an entire right wing media tour. She gave interviews to the New York Post, Tucker, all of that um, and registered as a media company, uh, registered a trademark. So yeah, I wanted to, I, I thought it was quite important and in the public interest to find out who was running it. So there are several arguments against your article. One is that this person's identity was simply not newsworthy. Hmm. Uh, those, are, those are dumb arguments, of course. Not newsworthy. Well, she says, uh, I, that, that was the interesting thing, is that she says, well, this person could have been a foreign actor, could have been some kind of foreign agent, could have been, um, could have been a, a foreign government. This was a, this was an attempt by a foreign government. Maybe libs of TikTok is a is a creation of the Chinese government or something, or or no, well Putin, of course. Maybe this was Putin himself was behind libs of TikTok, maybe. And I, I'll tell you this right now: this is the one concession I will make uh, on behalf of um, of Taylor Lorenz and, and anybody else who agrees with this. If it had turned out that Putin was running Libs of TikTok, then I would agree that that would be newsworthy. Okay, that's worth writing a news article about. But before you published the article, you discovered that it was not Putin, and it was not a foreign agent, and uh, it was not anybody, it was not any kind of shadow, shadowy figure. It was just some, it was just a woman, just a regular woman. And so you, you discovered that, This was a regular private citizen, an American citizen. No known ties to Russia, although I'm sure you're looking for him, but uh, you haven't found him yet. And you discovered that, and yet you decided to publish the article anyway. And that's the best she could do. That's the best she could do in justifying doxing this woman. Is that maybe she was a foreign agent, but she wasn't. 
Like the most that that excuse could get you is justifying looking into it, which I don't think it even justifies that because there's no reason to think that, that a foreign government would have to be involved in this. What Libs of TikTok, TikTok does is, is uh, as I've said many times, is important. And also, I imagine, time-consuming, but also pretty simple. It's like all she's doing is just looking at TikTok and then taking the videos that are the most outrageous and putting them over here. There's no reason to think that there's any kind of government funding behind it. But if that gets you anywhere, it just gets you to the point of looking into it. If even that far, it certainly does not get you to the point of publishing the article um, with the person's name attached. Let's get now to the comment section. Daily cancellations are the law. You know, it's exhausting uh, just living in this culture and dealing with all the things that we talk about on the show every single day. Maybe even listening to the show sometimes is exhausting, and that's why you need a Helix mattress. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for you and the way that you sleep. Everybody's unique, and Helix knows that, so they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Mattress is great for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pain. So if you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz, you order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, and it's shipped for free. It's as easy as that. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Helix is awesome, but you don't need to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. All you got to do to find out why is go to helixsleep.com slash Walsh, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life guaranteed. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't want it, but you will. Helix even has financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering up $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Walsh. That's helixsleep.com slash Walsh for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Connor Noonan says, Matt, as the world's leading LGBTQ plus author, we the people demand that DW Kids has a Johnny the Walrus cartoon. Well, I've the peop- I've read this comment many times, and the people are demanding it. I'm demanding it also. Not that my demands really mean anything around here anyway, but I will make the demand. Um, let's see. Matilda says, I think it's weird that people are so concerned about Disney losing privileges in Florida. It's not as if they're being sanctioned. They're just not being coddled anymore. If their special tax rules have been in place for almost 60 years, they should have been reevaluated by the state either way, not just rolled on for for eternity. And right, you would think the people, especially the people who are so critical of, of big corporations and so suspicious of rich people, you think that they especially would say, let's look into this. Let's not just what, so keep it going in perpetuity, these tax privileges? It's at least time to reevaluate. I agree with you on that. Um, Elizabeth Ball says, dang, what a shame for the price of one gallon of gas you could get a month of incredible satire, content so rage-inducing that watching it burns more, cal- watching it burns more calories than a workout, and all the little side stories that weren't important enough for the real media. RIP. Yeah, CNN Plus. Another tragedy. It is a, it is a tragedy uh, in many ways. Um, Connor says, I already read that one. Okay, here's this one. It says, Matt, uh, JT says, Matt, you used to be a Christian, but now all you do is stoop to the left's level. I'm extremely disappointed and have almost completely stopped listening. Please go back to who you were before. Um, I always find these kinds of comments uh, interesting because first of all, I've always been like this. So I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. I don't like it when people try to start rumors that there was a time when I used to be much more gentle and kind of a nice guy, that, I, I assure you that was never the case. As far as stooping to the left's level, um, yeah, you know what? That's exactly what I'm doing. I think there are a lot of people on the right who agree with, who, who take the same approach as me, and they would take issue with you describing it as stooping to their level. But I don't take issue with it. And, you know, and in fact, I'll, I'll accept that. I am stooping to the level. Why am I doing that? Because, um, because that's where they are, right? If I want to land some blows, I got to be where they are. 
okay? If they're stooping down in the mud, in the muck, and I'm standing up here and I don't want to get my hands dirty, I could swing away all I want and I'm just going to be punching the air because there's nobody there. And I think so often with conservatives, you, you want to fight battles the way they were fought 40 or 50 years ago when it comes to political and ideological issues. And you're, you're basically, you're fighting an opponent that, who doesn't exist anymore. You're fighting a version of the left that no longer exists. And so if you want to make any kind of impact at all and win any battles, then you got to go where that your opponents are and fight them there. And if the battlefield's a little bit muddy and uh, and it's 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 a little bit ugly, well, that's just that's how it is. That's the world we live in right now. That's the culture we live in. So yes, I absolutely stoop to their level. I, I will accept that, and I make no apologies for it. Well, if you've been living under a rock and you haven't heard the six million times I've mentioned it on this show, then you might be unaware that I've written a children's book and it is changing the world as we know it. It sold out in less than 24 hours and at one point was crowned the number one best-selling LGBTQ plus book on Amazon. The book is called Johnny the Walrus and I'm sure it will serve as an inspiration for the entire LGBTQ plus community for centuries to come. As mentioned, the book sold out right away due to its immense popularity, but I have great news for you. The book will be back in stock tomorrow it's finally happening. It's finally here. That's why you need to head to johnnythewalrus.com and reserve your copy right now. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. You know, there is some uh, symmetry to the show today. We started with a network TV morning show celebrating the grooming and indoctrination of a young boy. We end with something tragically similar. In this case, the Today Show website, today.com, features an article with this headline. I wanted my son to reject masculine stereotypes. Then he fell in love with tractors. All my life, I've prided myself on blurring gender lines, but when my young son started to gravitate toward the very things I'd shunned, I wasn't sure what to do. Now, the column is written by a guy named Jay uh, Dietger, whose Twitter bio tells us he's a stay-at-home, co-sleeping dad and a recovering schmuck. That's how he describes himself. And it appears that his recovery is not going well, sadly. Jay, doing absolutely no favors to stay-at-home dads who are worried about negative stereotypes, tells us that he is, uh, he's done his best to indoctrinate his young boy into being as effeminate as he is, but so far it has not gone according to plan. He writes, quote, After turning two years old, my son, Avishai, that's the son's name, started demanding that he only wear tractor shirts, and my mind spiraled into darkness. I catastrophized worst-case scenarios, imagining a world where he fell for everything stereotypically manly. I envisioned him on a football field, barreling through mega-muscled opponents. I imagined him waxing a sports car on a warm summer, summer day. Yeah, what a nightmare that would be. Dear God, imagine if your son becomes athletic, strong, talented, and financially successful. Who, who would want such a thing? Who, who would wish for such a curse upon their son? Well, certainly not house husband Jay, who continues... I've always judged other guys who seemed boxed in by masculinity, but three and a half years ago, when I became a stay-at-home dad, my bias skyrocketed. We co-slept, and he snoozed with his head resting on my chest, listening to the rhythm of my heartbeat. I began attending mommy and me playgroups and bristled when other caregivers made jokes about me providing da daddy daycare. Well, at least we could take solace in uh, the assurance that the moms at the playgroup are bullying Jay. I kind of imagine him sulking in a corner, eating Activia yogurt and crying softly to himself. And that thought at least brings me some joy. House husband Jay continues, I grimaced at anyone driving a Ford car, the John Wayne of automobiles. I hated men who wore plaid. How dare you, sir. I felt ill if somebody mentioned a wrench or another tool. When my mom-in-law bought Avishai a coverall with footballs on it, I shoved it into the depths of his closet, never to be found. Well, this is some more good news for me, I guess. I'm always looking to pad my victim resume, you know, and uh, kind of pad my stats a little bit. And now I know that I've been discriminated against for being a member of the plaid community, a person of plaid, as we call ourselves, POP for short. At least I'm being discriminated against by one person, and he just so happens to be a man who actually wrote the sentence, I felt ill if somebody mentioned a wrench. And he didn't mean it as a joke. Let's read just one more section of what is certainly at least in the running for the title of most pathetic diatribe in human history. He continues, 
Once my son could walk, I paraded him through the park while he rolled his baby doll down the sidewalk in his stroller. I felt accomplished because he mirrored being a caretaker. But then came the tractors. It started with YouTube. One On days I was especially drained, I'd sit avishai in front of the TV and click on Little Baby Bum. He fell in love with the tractor songs, and I was so worn I didn't care. When he asked to watch clips of construction equipment, I mindlessly pressed play. But when he demanded the shirts, I felt like I failed him. I pride myself on blurring gender lines. I wanted him to also. Okay, I take it back. This is not in the running for the most pathetic diatribe in human history. It has certainly won the title. All other competitors are left in its dust. House husband Jay talks about his toddler discovering tractors the way that that most parents might talk about their teenage son developing a heroin addiction or something. He's devastated by it. Though as the piece drones on and on and on and on, uh, the house husband eventually does come around to sort, sort of accepting his son's masculine tendencies. He's at least accepted that he can't completely deprogram his boy and turn him into a, into a girl yet. Though I suspect he's not going to stop trying. For now, though, and for the foreseeable future, his toddler son is manlier than he is. And he felt the need to write an article and post it on today.com and let us all know about that. Now, it's hard not to laugh at house husband Jay Um, He certainly deserves all of the mockery and bullying coming his way. If only he'd gotten a whole lot more of it in his youth, maybe it wouldn't have come to this. But the laughter soon dies away when you remember that there's an actual real child caught in the middle of this neutered man's self-hating neurosis. And it demonstrates again one startling fact. That on the left, there's only one rule for children. Okay, they can be anything they want to be but they must become something other than what they actually are. They must be raised to reject themselves, their true nature, their authentic identities. So it's not that, and this is important, it's not that on the left, it's not that they hate masculinity per se. Even Jay himself, who faints and vomits at the sight of a socket wrench, doesn't despise the idea of masculinity. He just despises it when it's exhibited by men. He quite admires masculinity in women, which is why he's traded place with, places with his wife and ceded the man's role to her. Leftists certainly don't have a problem with brawny masculinity or pink and frilly femininity. They just have a problem with those things in their traditional settings. Boys can be as frilly and feminine as they like. Girls can be as masculine as they like. The only time a girl should be traditionally feminine is if Uh, it's actually a boy identifying as a girl. Just as the only time a boy should be masculine is if the boy is actually a girl identifying as a boy. The left has not waged war on masculinity and femininity directly. It has instead ripped these things out of their proper context and had them sort of switch places with each other. Now, inevitably, both will perish in that operation just as any tree dies when severed from its roots as maleness is the life-giving root of masculinity and femaleness is the root of femininity. But it's important to know just just how they've gone about doing this. It's also essential to realize that in a very strange and backward sort of way, leftists actually worship femininity and masculinity. Perhaps fetishize is a better word. That's what all the drag queen stuff is about. They just don't like either femininity or masculinity when they are found in females and men respectively. They want to switch those two things. So the theme, as always, is that people must reject who they are. Be anyone you want to be other than yourself. That's the core message. It's the religion that this man's son will be tragically indoctrinated into. And that is ultimately why Housewife Jay is today canceled. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Vodowski. Our associate producer is McKenna Waters. The show is edited by Robbie Dantzler. Our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. And hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Joe Biden stuns the nation by mixing up mask mandates with Title 42. Controversy continues to swirl around Florida ending a special tax giveaway for Disney and Twitter reverses course to reconsider Elon Musk's offer. That's today on The Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. 